Jim, I meant to ask you the other day when we were talking, how's your how's your pollinator bed project going? Boy, I'll tell you, uh, and everyone else who's listening, it's kind of fits and starts. Got some seed packets. But <laughs> well, that's, that's a, a start. <laughs> that's a start, right? But it's, they're not in the ground yet. I could stand. Advi- I could stand advice. Well, let me give you some pointers here because I've been doing raised beds for quite a while, and and there's a lot of advantages to doing them. And I think I think you'll like growing your pollinator plants in a raised bed. Hi, I'm Kim Flottam, and I'm Jim Tew, and we're here today talking about growing a pollinator garden for your, in your yard. And I'm I, and we're going to look at raised beds this time. And here's some pointers on how you might want to proceed if you're thinking of doing this. You are listening to Honey Bee Obscura, brought to you by Growing Planet Media, the folks behind Beekeeping Today podcast. Each week on Honey Bee Obscura, host Kim Flottam and Jim Tu explore the complexities, the beauty, the fun, and the challenges of managing honeybees in today's world in an engaging and informative discussion meant for all beekeepers long timers and those just starting their journey with bees so sit back and enjoy the next several minutes as kim and jim explore all things honeybees i need something simple you know you and i've talked about this before and you've given me some good pointers i I like the idea of keeping it simple you know so much of beekeeping is not actually keeping bees extracting (laughs) extracting honey isn't beekeeping and assembling equipment is not beekeeping. And putting in a raised flower bed is not beekeeping. So I need something that I can do a good job of that's simple and, for me, fairly quick. And that's, that's where I'm hoping you're going to be going somewhere today. Well, let me, let me it, it starts with the, the raised, I, I, like I said, I like raised beds because it's all in one spot. I don't have to go in a row to till. I don't have to weed. I don't have to do any of those things. It's just sitting out there out in the middle of the lawn next to a couple of apple trees that I've got. So, so I, I'm always in favor of a raised bed and I'll tell you the company that I've been dealing with for a lot of years and, and, and it's called uh, Gardener Supply and you can find them on the web at gardeners.com and it's only they're only one of many a lot of companies sell raised beds but i like theirs just because i've been using them for a long time they have metal ones that are of different heights they even have something even simpler and it's just a corner post that you can put your own boards into uh four you buy four corners and and you get the boards as long as you want them and they just slip into the slots on the corner post so you can make this really simple and really inexpensive and i, I think the only advice that i would give on a raised bed is don't get one that has a bottom because you're going to run into some watering issues and some things like that. If you just got your raised bed sitting on open soil, I think you'll have a lot better look. So how how big are you going to make yours, Jim? Okay, you're getting way out in front of me. First of all, if I don't have a bottom, how do I stop the grass that I'm putting the raised bed over? If I Do I have to take up the grass to put the raised bed wherever I'm putting it? You understand what I'm asking? I do, and you don't. You you just put you, you just put you pick the spot in your yard, either set up your raised bed or set up the corners and get your boards, and you just cover up that grass because the the, the material that you're putting in your raised bed will kill that grass, and that grass will add two things. One, it will add uh, 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 nutrients to the, the material that you're adding, and it add it it forms somewhat of a I'm going to say a, a, a structured bottom for a while so that when you water it doesn't just run all over the place well that's the right answer because if i had to rototill if you got to get out a sprayer kill grass take that up rototill that in uh that's probably not going to happen but if you'll (laughs) let me just build a frame over grass and then i assume which is a dangerous thing you do that you're going to send me to a landscape company to buy topsoil well you can put soil in if you want. Let me go back a half a step and and say you, you know you can be even simpler. You can put you can put fence posts in, you know, a 2-foot fence post and and attach your boards to that. I mean, this doesn't have to be complicated or expensive. Okay. It can be real simple. And it should be about a foot to 14 inches deep and and so that you can put in a, you know, t- uh, 10 to 12 inches of soil. That's all you need. 
So it can be as simple as you want it, or it can be as complicated and expensive and attractive as you want it, and and you can go all that direction. But the stuff that you're going to put in it, now here's what I use. You can get topsoil, and and it works, but it's heavy. It's really heavy, and as much soil as you're going to get. And and the, the other thing is is that it'll last as long, but it begins to break down. I use a I use a, 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 a product called Miracle Grow, which is a which is essentially peat moss and a bunch of you know a bunch of other organic huh. materials that that uh, I can put the, the the plants in. It's easy to work. It doesn't produce weeds. It's not very heavy. It's not terribly expensive. And and it uh, once you fill that bed up, you only you'll have to add a little bit every year because some of it breaks down and goes away. But it works well. Plants love it, and I think you'll like working with it. All right, all right. You're out in front of me again. Two questions, if I can remember them. Number one, isn't that going to take a lot of miracle grow? Well, that take, you know, for a, what would it be, a three-foot-wide bed, maybe eight feet long? Is that going to be five or six bags of miracle Grow? Is that stuff expensive? Well, it's going to cost you, your initial setup is going to cost you some money, but it's going to last you the rest of your life. Ah. So, I mean, if you put in dirt, if you put in topsoil, uh, it'll last, it'll, it'll cost you a little bit less, not much. And the other thing is, is you may just have part of your yard that you can just go dig up and fill fill up your raised bed with you know, topsoil from your yard or topsoil yeah. from you know the field yeah. out back or something. I mean, you can make this, like I said, as simple as you want it or as complicated and as attractive as you want it or anything in between. All right. All right. Now, before I forget, the other question, when I'm building these borders for it, these walls that you said can be 8 to 12 inches high, do I use treated lumber for that? No. Good question. I, I have tried over the years everything that you can imagine to to preserve those wooden boards, and everything works for a while. Some things don't work at all because they're toxic to the plants. So make sure that what you're using isn't going to be toxic to the plants. Ask somebody or read the label. But uh, I, I, so what I've initially finally settled on is. Either no treatment, just bare wood, and they last four or five years, and you got to replace them, or metal. And the metal will allow, I got some that are 10 years old that are metal, and they don't rust, and they, they don't bend, and they're just, you know, they're still huh. there in perfect shape. So, again, it's how much do you want to spend, and how much time do you want to put into it? Well, I'm, I'm really beginning to realize that. You know, my, my thought process is that the money I spend is on seed. It's getting the the wildflower seed, which is not cheap, but it's affordable. But I'm realizing that you got to buy metal bedding and some corner posts, you said, and get, get this soil in place. But then you've reassured me that once you get this set up, that this is for a while, maybe a long while, if you maintain it. Yeah, I, I, you know, I go up and every spring I'll go out with a, with a trowel or something and just work the soil up a little bit and loosen it up and uh, Ten minutes, you're done, and that's all the prep you need to plant your seed. You 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 spread your seed. You know, you're using pollinator packet or pollinator mix is what you're interested in, right? Yeah, right. And and the attention that pollinators are getting anymore has made those seeds very available. They're available in hardware stores and grocery stores and nurseries almost everywhere. People are selling pollinator mixes because they know people like you want to start doing this. So once you get one of those. If you can buy a name brand, good. But uh, my my goal is bulk rather than than uh, brand name. You know, if you get if you can get a big package of seeds and only half of them germinate, you still got a half of a big package. If you get a small package yep. and they don't, so kind of look at it that way. So you get this, you get this, and you if you, all you're looking to do is produce a bed of flowers, you spread those seeds out. Um, uh, evenly over, you know, across the surface of your raised bed, you put in a, a couple of inches more of soil and pat it down and turn on the sprinkler and get out of the way. All right. I got a question about milkweed, but I want to hear from our sponsors first, but be prepared when we come back. Hey, podcast listeners. If you've got a couple years of beekeeping under your belt and you're looking for a new challenge... 
Available from Better Bee is the Hog Half Comb System, a mess-free comb honey system that you put on a strong hive for your bees to fill. Made of 32 to 40 individual food-grade recyclable cassettes, it only takes popping off the covers and sticking on your labels to get your half combs ready for sale. Visit betterbee.com forward slash H-O-G-G today to learn more and start making your own mess-free comb honey. My plan was, until you shoot holes in it, was to have a separate garden for milkweed for monarch butterflies that are not really for the bees so much. What what do with a, a bee plant that's not a bee plant, like milkweed? Well, I've done those a few times, and, and I, I like doing them, and I've spread them. Now I've got, a, I've got them pretty much naturalized throughout my yard. You, you plant them once, and, and next year you'll get a few that will come back, and the year after that you get a few more, and pretty soon they're a weed, milkweed. So w- what I would suggest you do, is start them in a small bed, a large flower pot, and then once they germinate, transplant them to where you want them. Just planting them out in in a ditch or in your yard someplace or even in a garden, their milkweed seeds are, are, I'm not going to say difficult, but they're they're a little bit tricky. And if you got them in a pot, they're right there in front of you and you can see what's going on and they're not going to dry out because you're looking at them every day. And once they get up, you know, three, four, six inches tall, then you can transplant them to where you want them to grow. And then next year you'll have a few, and the year after that a few more, and and pretty soon you wish you hadn't done it. Well, you know, I, I felt like a new beekeeper. What? What do you mean? I won't get honey the first year from this package? <laughs> what What are you telling me? I've got to do all this gardening to get these milkweeds to germinate and get these plants established, and then I'm going to have this weed a little bit like lamb's ear that bees like, but it just takes over the whole acre here. There's that, too. Get out of the way. I'll, I'll, I'll do that, though. I'll, I'll germinate it just to get a few of them going. And But I'm keeping them separate from the bee garden. Is that right or wrong? Well, you can put them in the bee garden. Um, and, and, again, they will. you will have milkweeds in your bee garden next year. And if, in all probability, the seeds that you're putting, the seeds that you're using to start this pollinator garden are mostly perennials. So many of them may come back anyway. Or you can harvest the seed and replant it next spring. Mm. Well, you know, I, I have done a few pollinator gardens before, always very small. The one that has been the most successful was hardly three feet by eight feet long, right in front of my shop right by the patio, you know, it was a little island of ground. And the flowers just went crazy. And then the second year, a lot of flowers, but not the variety I had the first season. And the third year, a lot of flowers of a few varieties. There seems to be a selection amongst the wildflowers of who gets to propagate themselves and who doesn't come back without me throwing more seed out there. Do something with that for me. What's happening? Is there a natural selection in my garden, my pollinator garden, for just a few varieties? It depends on on the plant. What I can tell you is that some plants, once they're pollinated, do well. They produce flowers, they produce seeds, and, and if they're left to their own, the plant will die after first or second frost. The seeds will fall to the ground, or the flower that contains the seeds will fall to the ground and the seeds will fall out of the flower into the ground and be there all winter and then come back uh, and germinate and grow next spring. I'm going to guess that those plants got removed. They got, you know, they were shaggy and ugly and after the first frost you moved them and the seeds didn't get to stay there. That's my first guess. Okay. The second guess is that the place where you put them uh, wasn't good for germinating seeds. Um, it, they didn't get planted. They just laid there, that sort of thing. Or something came along in the winter and ate them. All three of those things happen. And, and you know, you can, you can say, yes, I've got, you know, after three years, I've got tons of goldenrod, but I don't have any of the daisies and I don't have any of the other things. That's right? really painful because I mean, little birds, know. little wrens, Little wrens came in later in the fall and were just crazy about that little flower bed planting there. And I guess that they were eating more seed 
uh-huh. than I realized. You know, and a, and a good a good plant person would be rattling off names right now, but I can't do that. But more and more, as as the three years have passed, I've I've got a, a very much smaller diversity of flowers. You know why I was thinking while you were talking and and while I'm making plans, wh- why, Kim? Why are we discussing this again? And the reason for it is that more and more, my bees are having a hard time finding a place to live. Now, what I'm doing here is not going to save a single beehive. But if enough people had these pollinator gardens, it would begin to make a difference. And and more and more, there's a sign right now just outside of Worcester here, a full road sign right by the road put up by by a national group. That shows a bee covered in pollen and says, love it or lose it. This is our food system. I mean, that just made me want to weep when I drove by and saw (laughs) that sign. Because it was only 15, 20 years ago that the state I live in told me they didn't want to put wildflowers by the road. That stinging insects near the road were a traffic hazard. And now we're putting up road signs that said, well, maybe you don't want to eat, but at least, you know, you'll be safe, I suppose. Yeah, it's and the other the other part of this is that lots of people have small backyards, one or two colonies, and they're living in a fairly dense populated area. And you know, having a garden really is a trick. I don't own a ro- you know you don't own a rototiller, you don't have a place to keep it. So you can put one of these up. You can grow some vegetables in one, and you put another one. You put some pollinator plants in, and and you're right. You can't grow enough for your bees, but what you've got sitting in your backyard is dessert for when they come back from foraging someplace. Uh, so the other thing is, uh, if you've got one of these in your backyard, you can see which ones your bees like best. You know, which is the flowers that always has a bee on it, which is the, what are the flowers that never have bees on them. Uh, and, you know, given a choice, they'll, so next year you can plant more of the ones they like and, you know, begin to select uh, that way so that everything you plant is what bees really like? Well, I got a plan. I, my grandkids gave me seed packets that they got from Arbor Day, and I've, I've got a plan to make this work. And I do want to do it. I, I don't want to become a gardener, but I want to augment every aspect of my beekeeping, if that makes sense to you. That makes perfect sense, and, and I think you'll enjoy it. And doing the raised bed thing makes it a lot simpler. All right. I'll keep you informed. I'll send pictures if that matters, and we'll talk about it later. I'll even come down and take a look and maybe give you a hand. How's that? I I appreciate that a lot. I can use a hand. And while you're here, can you run a mower? Can I sit on it? (laughs) Yeah, you can. I I got both kinds. (laughs) Okay. Oh, by the way, while you're still listening, if you got a comment on any of this or you got a question on any of this, Go to our webpage, www.honeybeeobscura.com, and there's a place there where you can ask a question. And uh, most times we'll get right back to you if I can answer it. So take a look at the webpage. Take a look at uh, making a comment and let us know what you think. Oh, that's a good good suggestion. All right. Yeah. All right. Next time. All right. Next time. Bye-bye.